come down to a very important problem. Heavy black lead is condemned. These 14 or 16 monstrous errors, um, he says eight, therefore as per by a game condemned. And then by our apostolic sources, we recommend to pronounce condemned all the above doctrinal errors and mean all Catholics to condemn. Okay, what you've got there is the four causes of, in scholasticism. Uh, it's Aristotle. Aristotle says everything has four causes. There are two inside and two outside. Inside, you've got the formal and material cause. Outside, you've got the final and efficient cause. Okay, that's all Greek. But now, take, take a wooden chair. Um, the chair is made out of wood. The wood is the material of the chair. The, the wood is then given a form so that it has a back and it has four legs and it has a seat. That's the form of the chair. The form forms the, the matter. The, ma the form unites with the matter, just like the shape of the chair is completely united with the wood. The form and the matter are united, and they are the two causes inside the thing. And then you've got two causes outside the thing. Firstly, you've got the efficient cause, which means what effects the form, what puts the form, what, what puts the form into the matter. And that's the carpenter. So you've got the carpenter, the wood, and the shape of the chair. And then the cause of causes is what the carpenter did it for. The carpenter is outside the chair. What he did it for is outside the chair. You have two causes outside, two causes inside. So the final cause is the finis, or the end, or the purpose. The final doesn't mean last. It means the, it means the purpose. The purpose cause. So you start with the purpose cause. What have you got? You've got a carpenter who's thinking of something he wants to achieve, something he wants to do. I want to make something to sit down on. That's the final cause of the chair, something to sit down on. The carpenter then has this final cause, drives the carpenter, who is the efficient cause, to impose the formal cause upon the material cause. The lowest of the causes, so to speak, is the matter. The matter is the dumbest in a sense. It's just down there at the bottom, and it's going to have the final cause will drive the efficient cause to impose the formal cause upon the material cause. Okay? Final, efficient, formal, material. Now then, what you've got here is, if we're starting with the efficient cause, that, then what we're looking at is the four, the four causes that make up an infallible definition. The Church in 1870 defined an, an infallible definition. The Church defined her own infallibility. Pope Pius IX defined in 1870 the Church's infallibility. It's it does and it's quite strict. And that infallibility means that the Pope, the official, has to be official cause. He's starting with the official cause. The Pope as Pope. You know, it's not the Pope as Bishop of Rome or the Pope as. Um, um, the inhabitant of the Vatican, or the Pope as uh, the most intelligent man in Italy, the Pope has got to be acting and, and, and writing and thinking and speaking and defining as Pope. He's got to be defining as Pope. The Pope as Pope. And he's the only one who can do it. Um, he's defining. The, the form of a definition is its definitive character. This is it, guys. This is it once and for all. I say, I and Pope as Pope say, this is it. This is the truth. This is absolute truth. This is certain truth. That's the defining. The material cause, like the wood, out of which is the, the only kind of wood that the Pope can use to make a definition is something on faith or morals. If the Pope says, I think Manchester United deserved to win over when Manchester City. Um, <laughs> Uh, no way, Jose. Uh, no way, Pope Jose. No, no. Uh, if, I, if the Pope says I prefer mushrooms to cauliflower, no, that's not of interest. That, that can't, that can't be. I prefer bacon to eggs. No, 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 none of that. None of that. None of that. It's got to be faith or morals. So, and then finally, uh, the final cause is that he's going to um, bind Catholics. Okay, he wants. The purpose with which the, the purpose that the Pope has 
to define, to make an infallible definition, his purpose is to fasten Catholics in the truth, to give Catholics a certainty of truth. The Pope is not going to invent a truth that he's going to define. He cannot invent the truth that he's going to define. He can only take a part of the Church's teaching and make it definite. He does not make the truth. That's a crucial thing. He does not make the truth with a definition. He only makes the certainty of the truth. You've got firstly the reality, like let for instance the Immaculate Conception, which is what he defined in 1854. He made a very solemn declaration that the Blessed Virgin Mary was conceived immaculate, that by a miracle God intervened and stopped a miracle work inside the womb of St. Anne. The, uh, the, the, the Lord God stopped the usual contamination of the soul which God infuses in every human being for a human being to come into existence. God creates the soul and infuses it in the materials put together by the father and the mother. And usually, from the father's material, passes the contamination of original sin into the soul that God is infusing. Because the soul and the body, and the soul and the material, are very, very intimately united. They're only going to be separated by death. And at that moment, um, normally, the, because of the fault of Adam and Eve, or of Adam in particular, because of the fault of Adam, then no parents, no human parents, can normally put together a sperm and an egg without, at that moment of the infusion of the soul, the soul being contaminated by original sin. That's the fault of Adam, it's not the fault of God. Okay, that's the doctrine. Then, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is that at that moment, when usually original sin passes to the soul and contaminates the soul, by a miracle of intervention, by an intervening miracle, God stopped that usual contamination passing. And therefore, the, the, the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary was even conceived immaculate. You and I, all of us, were conceived immaculate. She was conceived immaculate. She's the only person that's ever, that's ever happened to in that way. Our Lord was conceived immaculate because he had no human father. The contamination passes by the father, not by the mother. It's Adam's, Adam's responsibility. And therefore, our Lord, having the Holy Ghost, the father, so to speak, he, um, for human, for father of his human nature, our Lord was never risked uh, contamination. Our Lady risked it, but she was preserved from it. Okay, now, the reality the reality, you start with the reality, then you have the truth, then you have the definition, and then you have the certainty. One reality, two truth, three definition, four certainty. The reality produces the truth, the definition produces the certainty. Okay? So, what you've got is the reality of what happened inside the womb of the of Saint Anne when she should conceive the Blessed Virgin Mary in her womb. That's the reality. It's a historical reality. The churches all us have often taught, often taught all the way up to the definition in 1864. It was common teaching, but it wasn't yet absolutely certain. It was, but it was common teaching because that was the reality that had took place way back in when the Mother of Bessel Virgin Mary was, was born, was conceived, which would have been about what, 16 AD, something like 16 AD. Assume that she became, assume she became a mother at the age of about 16, maybe 17, probably not much more. Surely not much more. So about 16 AD, we'll say. That's a historic event. It took place in 16 AD. At the time, practically nobody knew about it. No, no human being knew about it. The Blessed Mother, it, well, that, that, that's another question. We won't get into that. But it was completely unknown. But it's a... But when she became the mother of our Lord, practically nobody knew about it. Uh, when she, when the, the, our Lord was born, practically nobody knew. Nobody was yet really saying that she was conceived immaculate. That they, the shepherds, from the shepherds onwards, all kinds of souls had an immense veneration for the Blessed Mother of God. But it's only developed. It, it, only with t time did people say, "Hey, it's not possible she had original sin." It's not possible. Then others argue, oh yes, she's a normal human, mother. she must have had original sin. She was a normal human being. No, she wasn't normal, because she had, she, 
it's impossible that sin, that the tabernacle of her womb was contaminated or soiled with any kind of sin. That's not possible. So the argument got going. Generally, the church believed. And finally, in 1864, what the uh, folk did was not to create the reality. It's, when you think about it, it's absurd. He absolutely did not create the reality of what happened in the Blessed Virgin Mother's womb nearly 2,000 years previously. So, or 1870 years previous, uh, 1870 uh, years previous. The Pope obviously had nothing to do with that. But uh, nor did he have anything to do with the truth of all of those doctors down the ages that had said she can't have been conceived man. It's not possible. So, um, uh, we arrive at 1854, and the Pope then in order to give Catholics clarity and certainty in their minds. His purpose is the certainty of this great doctrine. As against, because it's a doctrine that obviously involves original sin, it's a doctrine that supposes original sin, it's a doctrine, and the, 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 the modernists, the modern world, the liberals, don't believe in original sin. So this was a great... Um, occasion to punch over to the wretched modern world that original sin is a reality, the church has always believed this reality, but the Blessed Virgin Mary was, pres was preserved from original sin. So obviously, it's a very doctrinal matter. It's pure faith and moral. And, the and, the, and, and against this wretched modern world, which is destroying women, which is destroying original sin, which is destroying human beings, which is destroying humanity, a great against this wretched modern world, the Pope Pius IX, punches over with a solemn definition, she was conceived immaculate. Immaculate, the one immaculate original sin. Okay. So, his purpose is to give the Catholics certainty of this noble and pure doctrine, which is not yet certain. It's widely taught in the church, but there are still some who deny it. The Pope says, boys, this is it. Okay. Purpose is the definition. And then the Pope speaks as both. He gathered together the bishops in the Vatican. He had a very solemn, it was a very solemn occasion. Silver trumpets, um, golden ornaments, you name it. Uh, but that's not what makes a solemn definition, the silver trumpets. The silver trumpets are there to, to, to solemnize the occasion, but they don't create the definition. The definition is the Pope as Pope. Speaking in order to define, in order to settle a matter for Catholics of good will, who are willing to submit their minds and accept the church <coughs> teachings. On faith and morals, as a matter of very much of faith, whether, they, whether anybody can be conceived of original sin, whether the, the best version of Mary is conceived of free of original sin. Faith and morals. And finally, um, speaking in defining fashion. So you've got the, the, the carpenter is the Pope. The definingness is the chair. The material is the faith and morals, the matter of faith that suggests <coughs> the immaculateness of the Virgin Mary. And the purpose is to give Catholics certainty as an anchor in their mind, for instance, as an anchor in their minds against the poor, wretched modern world destroying original sin and destroying womanhood, destroying family, destroying humanity. This is an anchor for poor Catholics to hold their minds clear against all anti woman and so on and so on and so on. So, um, what you've got in the text of Quanta Kur is the book that you've got in the, in the middle set of black print. Over on the left, you've got condemned. In the middle, you've got those four sentences. Over on the right, you've got three sentences, solemn, magistrate, and fellow. Okay, so what you've got in, in the text of Quanta Kur is, by our apostolic authority, we reprobate, denounce, and condemn. And that's the definingness. All the above doctrinal errors, that's the material of faith and morals. And we mean all Catholics to condemn them. Our purpose is to bind Catholics. Bind Catholics, we're not going to bind Catholics of bad will, but any Catholics that are willing to submit their minds to what the Church teaches, I, here it is, guys, I'm making you a present of this definition. For the poor, wretched, modern world, Every definition is a limitation of my liberty. Of my liberty. Oh, a definition. Oh, I have to think this. The church is imposing this upon me. The church is limiting my freedom of mind, my freedom of research, my freedom of intellect, my freedom of mind. Oh, horror, horror, horror. That's the modern world. Um, the, the Pope, the, uh, the, uh, the, on the other hand, there was a, I love quoting, uh, there was a 
famous Catholic convert in England sometime in the 19th century. And uh, he said, Oh, I would be quite happy if every morning at the breakfast table with the copy of the Times there arrived a new definition from Mother Church. <laughs> he had got it. He had understood that every definition was a hell for his mind to grasp the truth, to be certain of truth. Not for limitation of his ability, <coughs> but a, an increase of his power to think truly. Just like, um, you know, it's the difference between liberty to and liberty from. Um, what the modern world adores is liberty from, but what we need is liberty to. And I always give an example of, we're back in the question of liberty, the, the example of a, a, a great jet, let's take an Airbus 380, before it takes off from France to the Far East. There's the air, this huge plane sitting on the tarmac, and the, the pilot has a checklist. And he has to go through this checklist. And he's got to obey every little thing on that checklist. Because if he doesn't obey every little thing, if he makes one little mistake, the plane's going to crash. So he, before he takes off, he goes through this checklist. Now, this checklist limits his liberty from. He's, he's tied down to, tied down to, tied down to, tied down to, tied down to. But being tied down to all of those things, having his liberty from these things diminished, Having his liberty from exceedingly diminished, maybe there's a checklist of 100 or 200 items. He gets, you've seen him quite by sitting down in the cockpit. He sort of goes over the buttons, he goes over the dials, he goes over the charts, he goes over the little screens, he goes over everything to make sure it's all in shape. And then he make, the engine is on the ground. You've seen, have you seen on airport how a pilot walks just before a plane takes over? One or the other walks all around the plane. You notice that? And they're obviously looking at the flaps, they're looking at the, the, the it's an outside check. And there's the inside check. They need to check all of these things. They need to obey regulation 1, 2, 3, down to 300 to make sure that they can take off. But if they diminish their liberty from, then they guarantee their liberty to. The liberty to is the liberty for the airplane to fly. If you don't control, if you don't build, if you don't have a pile of of, of um, of regulations diminishing your liberty from, you're not going to have the liberty to. The plane is not going to be able to fly. So you have to check all of those things before the thing can fly. So, so an extra definition of church is another cockpit regulation, but it's another thing that guarantees your being at the mind being able to fly to heaven with the with the faith of the church. So um, you've got a the, every definition is an increase is a diminution of liberty from for the mind, but as the reader of the times, as the gentleman reader of the times understood, every definition that might arrive with the cup of the times on his breakfast table was an increase of his liberty at all. And the, the, this intelligent Englishman understood that liberty to is much more important than liberty from, because liberty to is what liberty is for. So, um, whereas today, liberty is just, in any case, liberty from, liberty from, liberty from. Uh, that's all the modern, modern, modern world understands about liberty. So what you've got in this text is the four conditions fulfilled of a solemn, a solemn and infallible definition. Now, your liberals did try to argue that quanta cura is not a solemn definition. But here it is that it is. I don't know how they try to argue, but I know they try to argue because they got, they're squirming to get out of these 16 errors being condemned. Bang, bang, bang. They squirm. Quanta Cora makes the liberals squirm, which is why the Archbishop angers his mind. Like the English gentleman, the Archbishop angers his mind in these definitions, which absolutely nail the wretched modern world. So, the modern world is way off track. The, the council which wanted to go over the modern world and all of these other errors are way off track. And the, ch the Catholic must hold his mind straight on the straight line that's been running for centuries and centuries and which the popes were defending until Vatican II. Pope Pius XII was still absolutely defending the straight line with the great encyclical, for instance, of Humani Generis. Humani Generis of 1951 really closes the series of the great encyclicals, the great uh, anti-liberal encyclicals, although Pius XII still wrote one or two more before he died in 58, 
Nevertheless, Humanogenes is a tremend another tremendous piece. Have, any, have I ever done Humanogenes with you? No. Well, that would be uh, for another occasion. It's a tremendous piece. Um, it's, it's a complete, it's, a com it's, it's like a syllabus. It's a compendium of the errors, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't make an infallible definition. It's a, it's a compendium of the modern errors. And then we simply have, so what you've got here is the four causes. What, what you've got, the four causes that would be defined solemnly and infallibly in 1870 are here in reality present in 1854. Therefore, the 1854, um, this, this paragraph, this section 8 of Quanta Cura, there's a very, very strong case, that's the least can be said, a very, very strong case for this being the church, an infallible definition. And so you can see why when Carl Ratzinger says, uh, when Carl Ratzinger says, oh, well, it's just a substantial anchorage, a provisional fixing of church doctrine, but that anchor needed to be pulled up and the church needed to move on to a different port, a different doctrine for the 20th and 21st centuries, you can see why the Archbishop gets upset with Carl Ratzinger and calls him an artful dodger when Carl Ratzinger weasels his way around uh, this definition. The definition is very serious. <coughs> Very serious. So you've got the four causes in the definition of 1870 are here present explicitly in the solemn paragraph of, eight, of, uh, of 1854 of Quanta Cura. And then finally, attire, the urgency of solution. Bishops who know that wicked publications are spreading, even denying Jesus Christ to be gone. Dear bishops, because remember, encyclicals are always addressed to bishops. So don't be surprised if you find them uh, a little bit demanding because uh, uh, they're not written strictly for laymen. Although, you know, there's no re absolutely no reason why a Catholic layman shouldn't study, read, and uh, digest and understand the encyclicals, but they were written for bishops. Teach men how, in order to be happy, they and their nations must submit to the Catholic Church. That's, you know, that's, that just makes no sense to 999 out of 1,000 modern people. Just makes no sense, but it is the truth. Alas, the conspiracy against the church is terrible. So, Pius IX was a conspiracy nut. So this, this very fruitful Catholic Pope, judging by his fruits, the fruits were a great consolidation and advance of Catholicism, or a great holding of Catholicism against a wicked liberal world, a godless world. That's the fruits. And therefore, um, the fruits of this conspiracy nut were excellent. Therefore, conspiracy nuts are not necessarily off the wall. Um, because in the 19th century, it's interesting, there was a, a French writer who, who, who studied Freemasonry and worked it all out and wrote a book about it. And then he took it to Rome, and I, well, I forget the whole story, maybe one of you can tell the story. Uh, he took it to Rome, or he took it to his bishop, or whatever, and the bishop said, oh, that's, that's junk, you're a conspiracy nut, or maybe some officials in Rome said, you're a conspiracy nut. And so he, in, he threw away the book and got rid of it, destroyed it, lost it. And then, I, I'm not sure there was Pius IX himself, I'm not sure, I can't remember the story. I should ought to know the story in detail, in any case, then, he got the message, the Pope got the message that this book had been written and destroyed. He said, I want that book. And so the good man wrote it all out again, obviously, he wrote it all out again. And it's one of the classics against conspiracy, against, uh, about conspiracy. And the conspiracy of Freemasonry, what is a conspiracy? It's people um, literally conspiring, breathing together. It's people getting together secretly to work out a plan of how to shift the world in a way that everybody else is not going to know. So that's a conspiracy. Um, and of course, conspirators are absolutely against anybody discovering what they're up to. And therefore, the liberal conspirators make total fun of conspiracy nuts. What they're in fact in is a, is a great conspiracy. The liberal conspiracy against against the church, but the liberals liberals cannot believe in conspiracy because for liberals the modern world is wonderful. So if you
So if the modern world is wonderful, how can how can there be people, how can the people creating it not be wonderful? So whoever you attack as a conspiracy, as a conspirator, the liberals say, hey, these guys are wonderful, they've created our modern world. So you say Freemasonry is awful and horrible and wicked. Hey, if they had an influence in creating the modern world, they're good guys. So you answer liberals cannot believe in conspiracy because they believe in the modern world created by conspirators. Therefore, the liberals castigate conspiracy nights. Therefore, they, the via media castigate and constantly make fun of conspiracy nights, ridicule them, and make fun of them. Well, that's part of the course, but it doesn't prove that there, there are no conspiracies. There are, of course, there are conspiracies. 9-11 um, was a conspiracy. Uh, the conspiracy of 19 camel drivers pulling off that stunt is a much bigger conspiracy, a much more unlikely conspiracy, than 200 uh, Secret Service agents uh, pulling it off in one way or another. Um, so the, the people who castigate the uh, anybody that criticizes 9-11 as the result of conspiracy, those people who are conspiracy nuts themselves without realizing it, they believe in an incredible, in, uh, an even more incredible conspiracy of 19 Arabs um, uh, who don't even know how to fly pulling off that stuff, and so on and so on. So, um, the conspiracy against the church is terrible. Pius IX was in a position to know, because he was informed. God ensured that he would be informed about the ministry. Undoubtedly, Paul VI and Benedict XVI have been informed. Undoubtedly, decent Catholics who know about the conspiracy, who know all about Freemasonry, about Judean Masonry, They've come to the Pope and said, Holy Father, do you know this? Oh, yes, I know. That's nonsense. What can you do except walk away? Undoubtedly, Providence has provided for every single Pope to be sufficiently informed in modern times about the conspiracy. Some of them have taken it seriously because they have some two grain cells to rub together. They've taken it seriously and they want and they make use of the information they've given. Others say, ah, ah, ah. The liberal Pope say, ah, ah, ah. I'm smarter than believing in a conspiracy. You're just a silly conspiracy now. Okay, Holy Father, as you say, whatever you say, you can't ram it down his throat. You can't ram these things down people's throats. Either they've got the intelligence to realize that the modern world is not run by the people it seems to be run by, or they haven't. Disraeli, how many of you know that famous quote of Disraeli? The world is not run by the people by whom it seems to be run. How do you put it? Can you quote it? Oh, no, I don't know. There's a hidden power. This writing in the middle of the 19th century, the Jewish English uh, conservative prime minister, who flattered Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria much preferred Disraeli to Gladstone because Gladstone was a prim and proper puritan who lectured her every time he met her. And Disraeli was a smooth Jew who flattered her every time he met her. So, dear Queen Victoria, rather preferred. The smarmy Jew. But Disraeli was smart, of course he was. So many of the Jews are smart. Um, he preferred, uh, she preferred Disraeli to that stuff. The conspiracy against the church is I wish to stir up Catholics to pray. However, prayer comes best from the pure heart, and so we are granted a special thing in Douglas Paul. To give force to our prayers, let us go through the Mother of God, through St. Peter and Paul, and all the saints, with our apostolic blessing, Rome, December 8th, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, short enough, 1864. Okay, any questions there? Now, the syllabus, the syllabus is an appendix to Quantum Core. It was published at exactly the same time. And it, it's, not, it's not got the same weight as Quantum Core. Quantum Core is 16 propositions, most solemnly condemned. The syllabus is 80 propositions listed. The propositions of the syllabus have the weight of the document from which they're taken. Pius IX had already in 1864 written several encyclicals since he became Pope in 1846, and especially since he came back, got back to Rome in 1851. And he realized uh, he he wrote several encyclicals, and if you look at the original syllabus, I think you will find against each of the errors. The source, um, the, 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 
the writing, the document, the encyclical of Pius X, Pius IX, from which he has drawn uh, this, where, where you find the error it, it explained at some length and condemned at length. When, where the document where you find the explanation of this error. So, um, put far part one above part two so that you can see the whole thing. And you can see that um, from top to bottom, from number one to number 80, it's errors. So don't read any of the propositions and think that that's what the church is defining. It's the opposite of its defined, it's, it's, it's teaching. These are all errors, okay, that's a key point. Firstly, at 1 to 18, uh, you've got errors of ideas. Uh, you, could, you could say doctrine, and then, or faith. And then 19 to 80, you've got morals. So there's, there's a, 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 the central gravity is in the morals. There are many more propositions in morals, but the propositions of doctrine are always more important. Doctrine is, faith is always more important than morals. Because ideas always go in front of action. Morals concern action. Action always follows from some idea. Always some idea goes in front of any action. I'm hungry. I, 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 hungry needs food. I will go to lunch. Uh, always some idea goes in front of any action. I want to get back to uh, some... some um, Berkeley this afternoon because uh, I want, uh, I hope there's still some hog left for me by the time I get there. I've got an idea that this hog, I've got an idea that I like hog, and therefore I'm going to drive fast. Uh, action always follows uh, ideas. Okay. So the ideas are always more important. The modern world, action is more important than ideas. For the modern world, ideas are trash. Ideas, it doesn't matter what ideas you have. And that's rather than English ideas. Uh, that's an English idea. Uh, Aristotle said, if you want to philosophize, you're going to have to philosophize. <coughs> if you don't want to philosophize, you're still going to have to philosophize. Because in order not, in order to, to scorn philosophy, you're still going to need an idea that philosophy is useless and a waste of time. So always ideas go out in front. Ideas always go from. Even if it's only the one idea that ideas are trash, it's still ideas that are going up in front. And therefore, the first nine, nine, 18 propositions are ideas, 19 to 18, action. Not to scorn the, the, the errors of action, of course not. But that they, there's a reason why the popes nearly always, in encyclicals, nearly always have the error of ideas front of the errors of action. Because the errors in action simply flow from the errors in the ideas. The church is all, mother church is always disentangling ideas, disentangling truth from error, in order to disentangle right from wrong. Okay. Um, ideas, 1 to 7, absolute rationalism, 8 to 14, moderate rationalism. Rationalism, it comes from the Latin ratio, it means reason. Rationalism is the exaggeration of reason. The error that reason alone, natural reason alone, my thinking, my natural thinking process, can arrive at all truth and is, is supreme. My reason is supreme. If you went around underneath a motorway which is raised on pillars with a black can at night and you spray painted, reason rules, reason rules, you spray it on each other, that's rationalism. Reason rules. Human reason is tops. Human reason is number one. Forget about God. Human, my brain is it. That's rationalism. And so he's got firstly absolute rationalism, and then more dangerous, moderate rationalism. Why more dangerous? Because it's less blatant, it's less crass, it's more subtle, it's closer to the truth, it's more dangerous. The crass error is way out in the open, I've got no problem in rejecting it. Two and two equals five, I know it's nonsense immediately. That's, that's absolute nonsense. Moderate nonsense, like, well, I, don't, I can't think of a mathematical example, but moderate nonsense is more dangerous because it's more easily infiltrates. It most easily infiltrates. Okay, absolute rationalism. Firstly, notice against God. 
Um, and there it is right up front, there is no God. And that's the basic of the basics of the error. There is no God. God is nature evolving. There is, it follows there's no spirit, there's no freedom, there's no truth, there's no good or not good and evil, there's no just and unjust. There's no truth and falsehood in the mind, there's no good and evil or just and unjust in the will. So that to deny God is to undermine every ideal, every all truth, all goodness, all beauty. Everything is undermined. In our godless world, the, the artists are virtually incapable of producing anything beautiful. Because they've just they've got disharmony in themselves, they can't produce a harmonious or beautiful art, work of art. There is no God. God is nature evolving, no spirit, nothing spiritual, everything is just matter. No freedom because everything is matter and material matter is not free. Freedom is, goes with the spirit, which is not tied down by matter. But the moment something is tied down by matter, like a computer, there's random chance, but there's not freedom in the true sense of the word. You might make a computer random or seem random, but of course, strictly, not even the most random working computer is in fact random. Because if you knew all of the material elements entering into it, you would see why what appears random is not actually random. It was the, what the computer came up with was determined by the electrons spinning around in this way, not in that way. There is no freedom in any computer. No genuine freedom. There is only randomness, which is simply um, the which is simply unobservable determinedness. It is still determined. Um, two, God does not act upon men or upon the world. Uh, firstly, he does not exist. Secondly, he does not act. If you, perhaps you may think he does exist, but whether he exists or not, in any case, he doesn't act upon the world. He's like a clock maker that set up the clock, wound, wound it up, lets it tick all by itself, and then has nothing more to do with it. That was a conception of God. That is a rationalist conception of God. It's the 18th, an 18th century conception of God. Completely false. God is acting all the time upon the world. I can't raise my little finger without God giving me the strength to do so. I can't hit God in the face with a mortal sin without God giving me the strength to do so. God does not give me the sinfulness of my sin, but he gives me the power, the ability and power to commit the act which is sinful. It's my free will which chooses the sinfulness, the sinfulness of the sinful act, but it's God who provides everything that's positive and good in the act. Um, human reason, third three, against the supernatural. Human reason is its own truth and law, and it can assure men's happiness. That's rational. <coughs> human reason is enough. Human reason, there's no truth or law that human reason can't grasp, or which human reason should not be sovereign. And human reason alone can ensure men's happiness. And that's obviously what huge numbers of people today believe. We don't need God. We don't need Jesus Christ. We can make a human society without God, without Jesus Christ, without the church. Terrible error. Terrible mistake. Why? Because of original sin. Not only because of original sin, but also because... Uh, the human mind alone, that nature alone, is incapable of grace and of the of faith, which is in the supernatural order. And without faith, we cannot please God and we cannot get them. So it cannot ensure men's happiness. It can ensure men's happiness in the next life because, it's, because nature is incapable by itself of a supernatural act of faith or charity. It cannot ensure men's happiness in this life because of original sin. You cut out religion, and original sin is going to run away with the show. Four, all religious truths originate in reason, which can guide man to all truths. Human reason alone can guide man to there being three, three and one, one and three, God being three and one, one and three, nonsense. Human reason, human reason is incapable of grasping the Holy Eucharist. That God is substantially, truly, really present beneath the appearances of God, the bread and wine. Can't grasp that. It's, it's ungraspable by purely human reason. Purely human reason says it's nonsense that God can be hiding beneath 
uh, a piece of bread and a few drops of wine. It's, it's nonsense. Human reason is incapable of that. But the, the rationalists say, and then the rationalists, what the rationalists will say is, if it's a reason which my, if it's a truth which my reason cannot grasp, then it's not a truth. So the human reason is not true. Because my reason cannot grasp it. My reason is the measure of truth. Instead of truth being the measure of my reason, my reason is the measure of truth. Instead of God's truth being the measure of my human reason, my human reason is the measure of God's truth. It's man in the place of God. It's the great apostasy of modern times falling away from God. Divine revelation is incomplete and pr progresses with human reason. And what does the church teach? The church teaches that divine revelation was complete with the death of the last apostle. Why the death of the last apostle? Because revelation certainly includes everything that's in scripture, everything that's in the New Testament. The New Testament went on being written until, for instance, the apocalypse. And it, the written, I'm sorry, the written revelation went on at least until the last book was written of the New Testament. And that would be until the book of the Apocalypse, which was written, I probably, I don't know what the scholars say, probably in the 90s. I think John the Apostle was supposed to have died in the early 100s. He was an old man. He was a youth at the time of our Lord. Um, he lived a long time. Um, so the written revelation, but then there's also the handed down revelation, the, the tradition. And tradition, just as the apostles were capable of <coughs> revealing uh, truths that our Lord had entrusted to them, the apostles, they re 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 revealed that in writing until they died, so also they revealed it in speaking until they died. But once all of those apostles died, then the, the, the direct revelation from our Lord through his, through his twelve apostles came to an end. From then on, revelation is complete. It will go on being explained, it will be go on being deepened, the understanding will go on being deepened, but the truth will not be changed and the truth will not be expanded. So that's there will be a development of doctrine, but not an, an extension of truth, only an improvement of human beings' understanding of the depths of that truth. Human beings discover it. Um, divine revelation is incomplete and progressive with human reason. Six, Christian faith is opposed to reason and harmful to human perfection. That's, so here you've got this dreadful error of faith being opposed to reason. Think of, some of you are sure you know this from you before, think of a huge air going like this, and that's faith, and then think of a little R at the bottom, like that. The little R is the, the, the left hand stroke of the R is the bottom of the total left hand stroke of faith. So that re reason and faith are in perfect sync. Faith way overtops reason because faith can reach into the heart of the Godhead. For, by faith, I know all that I can grasp the supernatural mysteries, which my reason cannot grasp. So faith goes much further than reason, but it does not contradict reason. And reason does not contradict faith. It's a typical horror, horrible error of our times that faith and reason are opposed to reason. <coughs> and finally, number seven, finally for now, prophecies and miracles are a fiction. The, the, the rationalists simply deny miracles. They deny the, the kind of prophecies. So when, for instance, in the book of Daniel, there's an astonishing prophecy of events that would be 400 years later. Daniel lived in the 500s BC. And in the book of Daniel, in the 11th chapter, you've got a sort of detailed history of events in the, in the 100s, I think it is, in the 100s. So 500 to the 100s, 400 years ahead, Daniel is describing history. It's there in scripture, you can find the chapter. chapter. So the rationalists say, Daniel was really written by somebody in the 100s. Did he have to get out of it somehow? But uh, it's, it's incontestable that what Daniel writes corresponds to the events so much later. 
Daniel also writes about the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, and so on. So, that, but the rationalists can't handle that, so they simply pretend it was written by somebody else. Uh, miracles are a fiction. Mysteries are merely human, and Christ is a myth. Horrible blasphemy. Um, what, what you've got here is modern minds absolutely refusing the depths and the heights of divine mystery and divine revelation. Cutting God right down to size to fit inside <coughs> my little head. My little head is number one. I am king. I am number one. My little head is the measure of God. And anything of God that pretends or is supposed to overflow the limits of my little reason is just nonsense. That's absolute rationalism. At half past eleven, we will pick up with moderate rationalism.